Okay, we're recording. Okay. People are entering. Yeah, I have a button that says show captions, but I'm not seeing one that enables captions to be on. So I'm not sure if that's just automatic. Yeah, the, the captions are enabled, so you're you're good. You don't have to keep them on for yourself. Right. I will share my screen then and we can get started. All right. Share. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Invasive Species Center's webinar series. My name is Elizabeth Patterson, and I am the Programs and Science Policy Intern at the Invasive Species Center, and I will be your moderator for today. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Invasive Species Center honors the long history of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Nation peoples on the lands now known as Canada and strives to show respect to their ancestors, their communities, and to them individually. We greatly appreciate the significance of the lands, waters, and all living things and offer our gratitude to the Indigenous people for their care and teachings about our Earth, our relationships with Indigenous communities are important and we will continue to listen and learn how we can be in a good relationship with Indigenous peoples, the lands and waters and all living things and act accordingly. The Invasive Species Center respectfully acknowledges that our head office is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Batchewana and Garden River First Nations, as well as the longtime settlement of the Métis people in the Robinson Huron Treaty area. The Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit um, organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canadians, um, that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. Uh, we've got lots of great invasive species resources on our website, including species pr profiles, best management practices, and more. So check us out at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. Um, you can also sign up on our homepage for our newsletter, bi-weekly uh, media scan and event invitations, which is where you can hear about upcoming webinars. Um, the IEC has also launched a new invasive species program that offers virtual courses on topics related to invasive species. We currently have two courses available which focus on different forest invasives, but we'll be releasing new content regularly, so stay tuned for that. Make sure to check out our website and sign up to receive updates on when these new courses become available. Before we get started with today's webinar, there are a couple of things I would like to mention. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions at any time, please type it in the question box and I'll read it to our presenter after the webinar. If you are having technical difficulties at any time, please type them in the chat box or respond to the email found in your registration and we will try to resolve it for you. We've also enabled closed captioning. So if you would like to follow along that way, we can turn that on with the closed caption button. Um, sorry, you can turn that on with the closed caption button on your taskbar. Um, lastly, there will be a very brief survey following the webinar. If you could take some time to fill it out, we would really appreciate it. So today's webinar is titled First Wild Record of Marble Crayfish in North America. And we have two very special guests today, um, Brooke Schreier and Dr. Primak Hammer. 
Um, Brooke Shire is the assistant coordinator with the Invadive Spe Invading Species Awareness Program out of the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. In his eight years with the program, his work has focused on aquatic invasive species, including outreach and education, surveillance and monitoring, and tracking initiatives. More recently, he has focused his efforts on monitoring programs, including the Mystery Stale Management and Removal Project, Wild Pig Surveillance Program, and working with partners on the Marbled Crayfish Working Group. We also have Dr. Hammer with us today. Dr. Hammer is a freela freelance crayfish biologist working in cooperation with Fisheries and Oceans, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, as well as Trent University. His research centers on the distribution and life history of aquatic and terrestrial crayfish, crayfish species, as well as the expansion of exotic crayfishes in Canada. He has been identifying and tracking introduced species, such as the marbled white river and rusty crayfishes in the province, and has recently produced um, a comprehensive report on the impact of invasive crayfish species in Ontario. He's published uh, numerous scientific and popular articles dealing with Canadian and Australian crayfishes. And I will hand the mic over to Brooke. Awesome. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. I'm just going to get my slides shared here. If you let me know if they're up. Are you able to see those okay? Yes, looks good. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the Invasive Species Center for inviting me and Premick to speak about marble crayfish today. Um, I, I kind of wish that I was coming to speak about marble crayfish under a better premise, but alas, it's, it's still really important that we get this education and outreach out there. And I think you can discern from the title, uh, First Wild Record of Marble Crayfish, Procambarus virginalis in North America, that, uh, you know, we have had discovery of marble crayfish in Ontario. So let's jump in. So a quick agenda for, for this webinar or for my, my presentation, it should be about uh, 30 to 40 minutes, I would say. And first, I'm going to go over who we are. Um, then I'm going to be speaking about what is a marble crayfish, or otherwise known as marmor crabs, and why is that significant for us. And then I'll be going into the history uh, of the first detection in Ontario, and we'll go over some of the follow-up monitoring, as well as the eradication efforts that we've done to date uh, collectively. And then finally, we'll, we'll jump into some, some next steps and, and what the future holds for us in regards to marble crayfish. So I think Elizabeth did a really good job uh, introducing both Premick and myself. I'm sorry that you can't see me. I'm just trying to save some bandwidth. Uh, you'll hopefully see me at the end when we do the Q&A, but uh, that, that's me on the right there. Actually, that was the day that Premick uh, took me out and, and caught some crayfish, and that was actually a, a robustus or a big water crayfish um, that, I, that I captured that day, uh, or sorry, common crayfish, I should say, not big water. And I was really excited to, to uh, have caught that crayfish. And it was actually a Bartonii, not a Robustus. Sorry, Premick, I'm totally tripping. So it was super exciting that day when he took me out and we were able to catch the crayfish. And this one in particular that we were looking for, and the reason why it was kind of rare was because this, this stream here in Bethany, Ontario, has actually been taken over by rusty crayfish. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with rusty crayfish. They've been in the province for, for a long time. And it's just another invasive crayfish that, that we have. And then, of course, Premick, uh, who this photo is from a day that he came out and did some marble crayfish surveillance with us. This was actually at the mouth of Pond One, and I'll be showing you some of the, the layout of the land uh, insofar as where we found them in, in a few slides. So who is the OFH? So I'm from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. We are the largest not-for-profit charitable fish and wildlife conservation organization in Ontario. We were founded in 1928 due to the concern over the future of Ontario's natural resources. And today we have over 100,000 members, subscribers, and supporters, including 725 membership clubs. And we're, we're involved in a variety of, of you know, outdoor pursuits. And we all share a common interest in sustaining our natural resources and the quality of life that, that really makes it possible. Um, where we house the Ontario Out of Doors magazine and one of our, our core mandates is really the enhancement of opportunities and accessibility for fishing, hunting and trapping. And we really, you know, as a science-based organization advocate for the conservation of our natural resources. And as we know, invasive species 
pose a huge threat to you know the environment, the economy, and to society, including human health. So back in 1992, the, the Ontario Federation of Niagara and Hunters partnered with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry to create what is now known as the Invading Species Awareness Program, or ISAP. You may hear me call it ISAP. And so that was well, 31 years ago now. And the, the core mandate of the program itself has, has changed. It has adapted quite a bit um, since it was really initiated uh, as a result of zebra mussels first being introduced to the province. And we used to have like the zebra mussel hotline but it's now known as the Invading Species Hotline. And our real focus is on uh, key pathways for introduction and spread through generating education and awareness. But beyond that, we also facilitate monitoring and early detection. We have the Invading Species Hotline. So that's 1-800-563-7711. You can call it Monday to Friday, nine to five. And that's if you have questions related to invasive species or you wanna report an invasive species, maybe get some help with you know, management ideas or something that you might have in your property give us a call and we'll help you out with that. Uh, we also facilitate EDMAPS for the province. If you're not familiar with EDMAPS, it's, uh, it stands for the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. And it is an online platform where individuals in Ontario can report invasive species and it will be, uh, every report will be looked at by experts either in-house or if we're not able to identify what it is, we'll send it out to a list of experts that we have abroad uh, to understand what it is you're reporting and then how we can help you try to, to manage that species. Then finally, we also support surveillance control and response. We've been on the Water Soldier Working Group, uh, working towards water soldier eradication for many, many years. Water Soldier, if you're not familiar, is an invasive aquatic plant, and it is currently found in the Trent Severn Waterway. Then we've also, we began the, the Mystery Snail Management and Removal Program back in 2021. And this was a collaboration between us and the CHA, or the Coalition of Halliburton Property Owners Association. And over three years of managing invasive mystery snails, so banded and Chinese mystery snails, our volunteers have removed over 930,000 mystery snails from those water bodies in that area. So it's a huge undertaking and really all the props go to the volunteers who have made that program possible. Then we also run the Wild Pig Surveillance Program. Uh, this is also in partnership with uh, Green Shovels Collaborative and the, the, the MNRF, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, uh, as we are looking for any possible occurrences of wild pigs on our landscape. And then finally, well, you can probably guess it from this presentation today, crayfish monitoring and the work that we've done uh, with many of our collaborators, which are here on the next slide. So in terms of the marble crayfish uh, world right now in Ontario, we are collabor collaborating with the, the MNRF, with Conservation Halton, with the City of Burlington, and with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, as well as many others. And we're all working collectively towards understanding what's going on with this species in the province, and then working towards eradicating uh, the population that has been discovered. So let's jump in to what is marble crayfish and why is this significant? So I apologize, the next slide is a little text heavy, but this is all really important information that I want the viewers to, to understand following this presentation. So what are some quick facts? Like what do we know about the marble crayfish? Well, it was thought to be first created accidentally in Germany, which is really interesting when two sloth crayfish, which I'll call them the, the parent uh, species, had been imported from Florida, which they are native to. So sloth crayfish are actually native to North America, but were imported to Germany and uh, during mating created what is now the marbled crayfish or Procambarus virginalis, essentially the, the virgin crayfish. And the reason why it's called that is, well, because it, it likes to reproduce parthenogenically and it is an asexual reproducer. So this is a species that is essentially just creating clones of itself. And the entire population is actually only females. No, no males have been observed in the population of marble crayfish. What's really interesting about this, this, this female crayfish is that its clutch sizes or when it, it reproduces, uh, in the literature it ranges a bit and maybe Prema can speak to this a little bit later, but. From the literature, it says the average size of a clutch is about 300 eggs, but they can range from 400 to 1,000. So when you have a single crayfish who does not need a partner in order to reproduce, it means that the likelihood of establishment, if, it, if introduced, is high. It's quite high because that means that you know two individuals don't have to find each other. It's just one female going through a reproductive cycle. And considering they reach sexual maturity relatively quickly, between five and seven months, I think anybody watching would understand that, you know, when you have sexual maturity that's reached at a relatively young age, 
and they are reproducing quite you know uh, abundantly and often uh, we we think that you know these guys can reproduce multiple times in a single season that means that you are going to have exponential growth of this species in a, in a water body where it's introduced now interestingly uh, in terms of their climactic tolerances or what sort, sorts of temperature ranges they can withstand the literature suggests that they can withstand temporary exposure to temperatures below eight degrees Celsius and above 30, 30 degrees Celsius. So as we know, you know, our climate is changing and as water bodies will warm, you know, our, our, our habitat and our ecosystems may become, um, you know, better for this species as time goes on. But as of right now, you know, that is kind of on the higher end, eight degrees Celsius. Many species can withstand even colder temperatures than that. But, you know, there's no reason to believe that these guys cannot overwinter, especially in places like Burlington, because uh, as I'll show you a little bit later, they have already done so. Beyond that, they can also to tolerate a, a, a various pH levels and low oxygen levels. So they're a resilient species, which many crayfish are. Uh, another trait that this species had uh, has, which is similar to other crayfish species, is the ability to burrow. So when, you know, uh, there's low oxygen levels in the water or if it's too cold, the species will burrow into the substrate in order to, you know, get away from that frost line so they don't just freeze to death during the winter. So these guys are, are resilient and, and they're, they're quite hard to nail down. In terms of the habitat that they like, you know, you're seeing things like ponds, lakes, canals and ditches, but they will also exist in rivers and streams. And as I said, they will create those, those burrows without chimneys which can be contrasted to some of our, you know, other species, native species, something like a digger crayfish, which will create a discernible chimney. That's exactly as it sounds. Like it's a hole in the earth where you'll see mud kind of built up into a chimney shape uh, like around that hole. Whereas these guys, as I said, will do so, but without those chimneys. Now, in terms of their introduction, what are those vectors uh, of spread? So a vector is a pathway, you know, how are these things getting here? And a big one previous to the regulations that existed was the aquarium trade. And I will be speaking about the regulations here shortly around this species, but the aquarium trade has proven itself to be the main vector of spread for this species. And, you know, both as a pet, because some people want, you know, crayfish as a pet, but then many people want these as fish food. Because you can imagine if you have a predatory fish that's a, that's a pet that likes to eat crayfish, well, now you have a crayfish that's reproducing asexually. So you're going to have essentially an unlimited abundance of food for your fish. So, you know, obviously individuals who, who, you know, have that predatory fish are going to want this crayfish potentially. Now, another thing that we've seen based on the last year of, of looking for, for ads and such of people selling this crayfish, um, they do range in cost. I've seen uh, really expensive costs of $50 per crayfish or as low as $5 per crayfish. And again, if you go back to doing the, the math of the clutch size, uh, these things can be, you know, like that, that's a lot, of, uh, a lot of individuals that you're able to sell every time they go through a reproductive cycle. Now, another means of introduction that we have heard is contaminated shipments of, of fish, such as goldfish. Um, I will be speaking about uh, an occurrence a little bit later in the presentation, and it was suspected that this species was introduced via a uh, shipment of goldfish. Now, that's not the first time we've heard of crayfish being in uh, shipments of fish. We have had similar stories of white river crayfish, which is another Procambaris species, being found, so in the same genus as this species, being found in shipments of goldfish. And if the day ever comes where, you know, this thing is on the landscape, if it is potentially, you know, uh, more abundant, there is a potential for bait release. Just like with any crayfish, individuals may want to use them as, as bait. Um, they would be doing so illegally. But, you know, you are allowed to use crayfish as bait in Ontario, but, you know, this being a prohibited species means that you cannot possess it, which I will get into in just a second around the regulatory um, you know, restrictions around this species. But first, I wanted to identify some of the main issues that's going on um, with this type of species. The individual who posted this, as you can see, they did not call it a marbled crayfish. They called it a self-cloning crayfish. And for those of you watching, this has been reported to the MRF. Um, so this is an individual who is trying to sell uh, marbled crayfish. And, you know, if you read the description there, within a few months, you will have a very large colony of crayfish to feed whatever hungry predator fish you have going back to what I said around, you know, individuals wanting these as, as fish food. So, you know, I can't get into too much around what's going on, but I do know that the MRF is, you know, looking into these types of reports or these types of sales. And, you know, uh, so what we're trying to do is, is prevent people from doing this. 
And if you're somebody who's on the line right now, who's listening, and you maybe have marble crayfish in your possession, get in touch with us, you know, give us a call. The main thing is getting these things, you know, out of, out of people's hands. Maybe you don't want to euthanize them, but it's really important that you never release these types of species into our aquatic ecosystems. Um, because any aquatic invasive species that's given the opportunity to establish in our waters or start reproducing in our waters, it just makes it that much more difficult to eradicate. So please don't release them, but get in touch with us and we'll work out getting these species from you so that they can be euthanized humanely. So let's go into marble crayfish distribution in the world. So this, this image here is from uh, inaturalist.org. And as you can see, you know, I mentioned that they were first created or thought to have been created in Germany in 1995, but the first report from the actual wild, so a wild uh, marble crayfish sighting was in 2003, but now, and that was in Germany, but now it is found in many European countries, uh, places like Ukraine, Austria, Hungary, Italy. It, there's also been a report from, from Japan. Um, you know, it was introduced to the island of Madagascar in 2007, and the literature around that says that Back in 2007, they had hundreds, and then within 10 years, they had millions, which goes back to that exponential growth that I was describing before. Then in October 2021, uh, that was when we, you know, when the report of this marble crayfish that we have in Ontario first popped up, and I'll go into uh, more details around that shortly. And then in the summer of 2023, a second iNaturalist report in North America reported from New York State was uh, followed up. And there was follow-up monitoring that uh, has been done there, and I'll go into that a little bit uh, later as well. And then finally, just two weeks ago, uh, we had a report, both Premick and I, from Nova Scotia. It was a, a biologist from DFO who reached out to us via email with a suspected marbled crayfish, which based on the photos, both Premick and I were, were able to confirm our marbled crayfish. Um, so there is follow-up monitoring going on there now at this time, and I will uh, also talk about that a little bit more later. So what are the impacts of, of a crayfish like this? Well, I think, you know, many many of you who are, who are listening may already be um, kind of familiar with invasive species. And if you're not, you know, these types of things, given their reproductive strategies and the fact that they reproduce via parthenogenesis, so again, asexually, it means that the likelihood of establishment if introduced is much higher than that of other species. Um, again, because they don't have to find a partner, right? But in terms of being introduced and the types of impacts they'll have, they will, you know, obviously compete with our native crayfishes and fish for food. And many of our native crayfishes are already imperiled by the introduction of something like a rusty crayfish. Again, that, that other invasive crayfish that we have. So by adding additional invasive crayfish, it just puts that much more pressure on our already imperiled crayfish species. These things will eat fishes, they will catch fishes, they will uh, just ultimately negatively impact biodiversity and alter our food webs as we know it. In terms of you know, what's going on abroad, uh, there, there are many reports of, of this species having negative impacts on fisheries in Madagascar. So we have proof and evidence that this will occur if they're able to establish themselves. But they're also gonna infect, uh, sorry, impact things like insects and mollusks. And they will also impact our aquatic vegetation uh, because if you don't know, crayfishes are omnivores. So they will consume you know, aquatic weeds um, but they will also consume almost almost anything that they come in, in contact with that they're able to consume. Not to mention acting as a potential vector for the crayfish plague. So there's a variety of impacts. And I think the biggest one being their ability to reproduce so quickly that they will be able to outcompete our, our native species. So jumping into the next slide here, I need to thank Premick right away because this drawing was actually done by Premick. Uh, not only is he a retired teacher, uh, an amazing crayfish biologist, but he's also an amazing artist, and he has done many of these types of drawings for us. You'll see another one later on on a sign that we developed, um, and you know, you just you, <laughs> you just see the types of detail that he's able to put into his imagery here, which is able to then help us educate Ontario's public around the key identifying features for these types of species. So when you're looking at a marble crayfish, I think you can get it from the name marbled. You know, it has a marble pattern on its carapace, which is quite evident, as well as the, the abdomen and, and claws. Um, the image there on the right is, is a little bit uh, fluorescent almost in, in its coloration. I would say the ones in the wild are a little bit more dull than that, but still that marble pattern is, is quite apparent. So you're going to want to look for that. They are a relatively small-bodied crayfish, four to seven centimeters in total length. 
So they're relatively small, right? And some other key identifying features. Another one that I would look for is uh, the claws. The claws are, are quite small in relation to their body. And another thing that they, they lack is, um, which, well, here, I'll get into that in just a second because I'm gonna compare it with an actual image of the other species. So let's move on here to the next one. Here are a few of the other Procambarus species uh, that I've already mentioned a few times. There's the White River crayfish, there's the Red Swamp crayfish. And truthfully, though somebody, you know, who has had some experience with crayfishes would look at these and say, oh no, those, those are completely different. I think the majority of Ontario's public do not necessarily, you know, have a high level of understanding around crayfishes, nor, nor, nor did I many years ago. And it can be very challenging to differentiate between crayfishes. It's hard to differentiate between fishes and birds and, and all these things, trees, you name it. And it requires time and it requires effort to learn those key identifying features that separate them. And as you can see here, you know, two species that are in the same genus, you would think, oh, they almost look like a spitting image of each other. But in reality, this white river crayfish and red swamp crayfish, I think, look quite different than that of the marbled, especially when you consider the size. Like these two species are relatively large and they're, you know, kind of a reddish coloration. They have that dark stripe down the abdomen or the, or the tail there. So if you see that right there, very distinct kind of dark. You don't see really any of that marbling pattern, but you do, do see a lot of tubercles, right? Like those light tubercles on the claws, and they, both of these species possess that. These two are much more likely to be confused for each other than they are to be confused for a marble crayfish. So let's get into, well, what, what could they be, you know, more realistically misidentified as? These are two native species to Ontario. You see on the left, and this is the one that I was going to mention there a few minutes ago. This is the, the calico or the paper shell crayfish, and this is Faxonius immunus. And you can see, right, it's relatively small compared to that of the marble, and it has similar, you know, what you might call marbling uh, on the carapace in the abdomen. But the key things to look for here is that hourglass shape down the body of the calico, right, that's, that's absent on the uh, marble crayfish. But also it's got these notches in the, the claw there, in the, in the, the opposable uh, appendage of the claw. So if you see the little crayfish and you catch it and you're like, oh, this may be a marble, and you see that notch right there, well, you actually have a calico crayfish. Then another one here is the virile crayfish. And if you look, it's got these you know, dark spots on its abdomen on either side, which is a key identifying feature. And then also their claws are just much larger in relation to their body, uh, and as well as just being a medium-sized uh, crayfish, so a little bit larger. So, you know, another one that you may confuse just because of a uh, potential for thinking you see marbling, but there are some dead uh, giveaways to differentiate the species. Okay, now getting into the regulatory uh, aspects around marble crayfish, it is listed under the Invasive Species Act as a prohibited species, and the Invasive Species Act was created by the MNRF in 2015, and today it does prohibit 22 species and restricts 11 species, and as I said, marble is one of those uh, prohibited species which means broadly that it's illegal to import, possess, transport, or release this species anywhere in Ontario. So you can't have it, okay? So again, going back to what I said, you know, please make sure that you do not have these things in your possession. Now, they're not the only prohibited crayfishes we have. We also have red, red swamp crayfish, which I mentioned, the common yabby, uh, which is native to Australia. So there are crayfishes that are on our radar as a province, but, you know, in the new year, I am happy to report that we will have a complete prohibition on the genus Procambaris, uh, which will uh, encompass all of those, those species that I mentioned before, White River as well, as well as Pastafasticus, so the signal crayfish, which is basically the culprit that was most responsible for the introduction of the crayfish plague to Europe, so another nasty species that's on the west coast uh, out towards BC that we do not want here in Ontario. Now, just as a quick aside, I don't want to get into this too much, but I do want people to understand that you know, marble crayfish is not the first Procambarus species that we've had show up in the wild in Ontario. Premick brought this to our attention uh, in 2021, and in 2022, we did some surveillance for white river crayfish, uh, Procambarus acutus, and we did just this past year find many specimens of this species. So right now, again, don't want to spend too much time on it, but we are working with um, Six Mile Lake Provincial Park. We've got signage up at Six Mile Lake Provincial Park. We've got signage up around Six Mile Lake in general in the Port Severn region to try to heighten the level of education and, and knowledge that around crayfish that's up there so that people know not to transport these crayfishes elsewhere. So let's get into the history of the first detection and the follow-up monitoring and eradication that has taken place to date. 
So back, I mentioned in October of 2021, we saw that first uh, record to iNaturalist.org and two photos were reported to iNaturalist, but they were actually um, listed as Camberid crayfishes. So in the family Camberidae, and you know, it, it was not identified as a marble crayfish. And as you can see from the photo, you know, it, it was rather difficult. Um, it was actually Premick who, when he, when he eventually saw it, brought it to our attention and said, you know, this may be a marbled crayfish. Um, so we, we began, you know, taking steps to, okay, we need to confirm this. The MRF got in contact with the reporter or attempted to make contact. And in the meantime, Premick uh, sent these photos to his colleagues in the Czech Republic who have had working experience with marble crayfish and they positively identified it as such. Now, it was interesting because as you can see from the photo, it was just along a path. It was, you know, late fall or it was the fall of 2021. So not great crayfish surveillance season, as you can imagine. So what we did was we did have to wait, but we waited until the next spring and we decided to go back to the location. You can see on the map there uh, at the top, the approximate location of the first iNaturalist report. And when we were there initially, we made contact with one of the groundskeepers and the groundskeeper actually said, oh, like, what are you doing here? And we said, we're looking for a crayfish. And he actually provided us with an image of a crayfish that he'd seen the fall prior. So around the same time as the iNaturalist report. And from the image that he showed us, which you can see here, Premick was then able to identify that as a marble crayfish. So at that point, we began uh, using various surveillance techniques to try to find a population that is in uh, potentially within the ponds where uh, around where these, these crayfish were found. Uh, we in incorporated environmental DNA sampling. So environmental DNA, if you don't know, is, an abil is our ability to take small water samples, put them through filters, and collect you know, uh, DNA within those filters, send them to Trent University and the MNRF's lab there, where they can test for the, um, for the DNA of various species, in this case, marbled crayfish DNA. We also did you know, the, the usual stuff, kick and sweeps and, and baited traps. And as you can see here, um, here's some of the imagery from us doing that, that type of work. Um, you see my colleague there on the left collecting a water sample. And then you have myself processing a, a eDNA in the middle, as well as some of our, our passive samplers that we had used that day. We primarily just used fishy cat food, I think, on the first day. And we caught predominantly um, rosy red minnows, which are um, kind of an ornamental variety or ornamental version of our fathead minnow, which is a native species. And then we also caught a goldfish, uh, which is not entirely unexpected. These are, you know, basically um, storm stormwater ponds for a Burlington or even ornamental ponds. So not entirely unlikely for individuals to potentially release goldfish into these locations. And from that day, we did not encounter any marble crayfish. So moving on, that was our first real surveillance attempt. <clears throat> but then we went back in August because the initial eDNA that we did, I think it was predominantly all negative. So we wanted to go back just to, to make sure. We wanted to go back. We were going to you know, collect a lot more eDNA. Um, we really upped the eDNA because we found that trying to find them physically was proving to be very difficult just given the ponds and the substrate. So we focused on eDNA and we collected six per pond and there are four ponds in total. And as you can see here from this image, um, you can see kind of the, the general locations of where we collected the eDNA around the four ponds. Unfortunately, the, the fourth pond or pond four, which is the one directly to the south you see on the, on the map there, it didn't really have much standing water. So, but there was some drainage there that goes down into uh, kind of a forested area. There's no, there's no actual physical creek or anything. So it pr probably just runs underground, but there is still drainage there. So we wanted to collect some DNA from pond four. So we, we did, and we did have, unfortunately, some eDNA come back with weak detections, but between ponds one and two. So predominantly in this area was where the eDNA uh, hits were found. So moving on, we went back in October because now that we had some positive eDNA, albeit they were weak, we wanted to confirm that. So we returned again. My, my crew went out to collect uh, an additional 24 samples doing the exact same thing we did back uh, earlier. And unfortunately, as a result of the eDNA that was processed by, again, the MRF at uh, the Trent's eDNA, or sorry, DNA building, we did have stronger eDNA detections come through. 
So around this time, uh, I can't remember exactly when, but the Marble Crayfish Working Group was formed. Yeah, I know you've already seen this slide, but this is the, the Marble Crayfish Working Group. We've all, we're all working collectively towards trying to manage this, this population that has been found. And these are the partners that have been out in the field, who have been monitoring, who have been developing you know, educational resources, putting up signage. These are the folks who are on the ground doing the work to try to prevent any further spread of this species. So in the ne next slide here, you can see some of the work that happened in the winter of 2022-2023. Um, the city of Burlington installed a fine wire mesh at that drainage on Pond 4 that I mentioned. Again, it was low risk for us only because it, where it drains, there's not really any suitable habitat anywhere for the marble crayfish to go. And as we've seen, they are walking. So presumably they're, they're probably just walking out of the ponds anyways. So this drainage this was just a precautionary thing, but it was great that they did it anyways, just to try to prevent any adults from going out uh, at that location. But as you can see from the images, the ponds were drained. They were drained as much as they could be, hoping to lower that, that frost line to hopefully freeze out any marble crayfish that are in their burrows that were potentially in this pond. You know, for those who are you know watching, again, these ponds, you know, they're man-made. There's nothing in here that, um, you know, there's no native fish species you know, in these ponds, there's nothing of real concern in these ponds. So our main concern was getting rid of these crayfish. So lowering the water as much as humanly possible to try to freeze them out uh, over that winter. There's another image from pond one. Uh, you can see where the, the water level has been dropped right down, trying to, to freeze them out. And I believe, you know, again, Prime can maybe mention this later, but I think this was the method that his colleagues in Czech Republic really, you know, endorsed was trying to lower the water level as much as possible in the winter to try to eradicate uh, the crayfish. And moving on, unfortunately, the following year, despite our efforts in the winter to try to eradicate them, um, you know, as you can see from that image, I think you can, you can discern what's about to happen. Um, in May of 2023, we did hand off the eDNA work to Conservation Halton. It was much easier for them. They were close by. We're about a two and a half hour drive one way to get there. So we handed it off to them to start doing the eDNA work. And they uh, did do some eDNA work. And again, we had you know some weak results, but we were still getting positive hits. And on July 5th of 2023, uh, I received a text message from the groundskeeper that a crayfish had been found on the deck of the pavilion at the park. And this would actually be the first physical specimen that we have in our possession. So it was a bit of a big deal. And unfortunately, what that did do, it was open a floodgate. So as I said, July 5th, we had the first specimen that was found. I'm just gonna go through this one by one. On July 12th, so a week later, we had a second live specimen found. A day later, two more were caught in baited traps. An additional crayfish was found on the road across from, from the pavilion. The next day, three additional crayfish were captured in traps. One was found by the garbage cans. You get the idea. So all of a sudden, we started seeing more and more crayfish. We returned. Uh, I shouldn't say we. I was not present that time. But on July 26th, Premick went back with our crew, and they were doing kick and sweeps. And a, ju a, a juvenile crayfish was captured. So I think, you know, based at this point, Premick and, and the rest of us were pretty comfortable with saying like, yeah, the, these things are reproducing in these ponds, given the fact that we found a, a specimen this small. So fast forward to July uh, and September and uh, 11th and 12th eDNA. These were done by Conservation Halton. So Conservation Halton had tried to up the amount of eDNA work that they had been doing. That pond there, the workshop pond, it was dry every time that we went, but I think Conservation Halton at, uh, during a rain event were able to collect some eDNA from that location. And then following that, they also went across the street to Novak Pond, which is, I think, again, Premick, you can correct me, but it's attached to the City View Park ponds uh, via, I think, a little, a little creek. So, and there is a, there is a culvert that connects them. And then finally, City View Park, which is what you're seeing there. So we're getting a number of positive eDNA hits from City View Park. And we did get some from the Workshop Pond as well as Novak Ponds. Now, Conservation Hall did mention that they were, they were concerned about a potential cross-contamination. As you can imagine, when you're dealing with DNA, it can be very finicky. And if you, for example, have, if you held a specimen in your hand and then go to process eDNA, you could potentially contaminate that sample. So what we did was following these for due diligence, we went back and on October 24th, we as a group, uh, as a working group, 
uh, went out to collect additional eDNA. So we were almost all present. So uh, Premic was there, MNRF, DFO, we were there. Um, and what we were trying to do was really, again, do our due diligence to see what we could find. On day one, we went to Novak Pond. We didn't want to start at City View Park because as I said, cross-contamination is real and we didn't want to you know, potentially uh, invalidate some of our findings. So we started at Novak, um, so which is again, this pond here. We collected eDNA, both syringe method and backpack. So we wanted to use varieties of, of methodology to, to confirm or deny um, the presence. We used four baited passive samplers that we deployed in the four corners. And then we also used electrofishing in some areas. The pond wasn't great for it because of the, the, just the topography of the pond, but DFO did use electrofishing. And then we did kick and sweeps where possible. And you know, no crayfish were found that day. And even the next day when we returned to collect the baited traps, um, there were no crayfish found. So here's a bit of imagery here from you know some of the day one work. That's the crew there. And then going into uh, just the different types of methods that I mentioned, there's the backpack eDNA on the left. Um, it's exactly as it sounds. And then here's the syringe, syringe method on the right. Uh, again, just wanting to use both methods just to confirm or deny and, uh, and compare the two. And then finally, our nets for kick and sweep and then our baited traps. We were using hot dogs this time. We've heard hot dogs are working great for, uh, for catching crayfish. So that's what we used. So then on day two, and we are winding down here, folks, don't worry. On day two, we expanded our search well beyond uh, City View Park. We wanted to understand, okay, what's going on even farther away from City View Park? We went down to Grindstone Creek, which is a well-traveled creek that runs through the Royal Botanical Gardens. Uh, we even decided to survey Hamilton Harbor. And in all of our, our searches, all we found were Northern Clearwater crayfish, which you, you see some of the, the specimens there, which is a native species and a big water crayfish, uh, Robustus, which we found as well. He looks like a grumpy old man here, but yeah, he's a beautiful native crayfish that was also captured. But day two afternoon, after all was said and done, after all of our monitoring was, was done, we went back to City View Park um, because as I said the day prior, we kind of stayed away from it. We didn't wanna contaminate anything. So in the afternoon on day two, we went back to City View Park. We had placed traps there the night before and we did capture seven marble crayfish in a baited trap overnight. Then we just all collectively took turns doing kick and sweeps at this location. And what you see there is Premick capturing, or Dr. Crayfish, uh, capturing his very first marble crayfish. And over the span of about half an hour to an hour, we caught many more marble crayfish just in this one location via kick and sweeps. And here are some of the images that you can see from the crayfish, different uh, life, uh, life sizes. You can see kind of a juvenile right there, you know, medium size, and you're getting into larger sized crayfishes. And on the right here are all the different carapace lengths that Premic measured from that day, including a three millimeter and a six millimeter carapace, which means very small crayfish and young of year crayfish. Um, so these are probably released by the mother maybe the week prior. And in total, we had 25 captures in a very small amount of time. Um, so what does that mean? Um, before I get into next steps, though, I did want to highlight what's going on kind of abroad. And this is a report from New York State that we received. I already alluded to it earlier. Um, that was reported to iNaturalist.org in July of 2023. And the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation staff did spend two days looking for any more potential marble crayfish, and no marble crayfish were captured or observed. So fingers crossed, you know, that's the, the last of it. Hopefully it was just this one specimen. As you can see, though, from all the other imagery you've already seen of, of reports, it looks like they like to crawl, right? They're, they're crawling across land. It seems to be the common denominating factor across these reports. And then finally, another report, which I already mentioned again, two weeks ago, again, look at that, crawling across land, right? Um, another marble crayfish identified by Premick and myself that was reported to us via DFO. I think they were contacted by somebody uh, in Nova Scotia and they went to, to collect the specimen and there's ongoing uh, surveillance that's going on there. So next steps. So this year, we're, we, we just met last week and we are going through another uh, round of draining the ponds. But this time, because we had more time to plan, we're going to be much more reactive to cold weather. So in 2020, 20, or sorry, 2022, it was so, uh, somewhat of a, okay, well, it's already, you know, November, December. Uh, we need to get out there. We need to do something. And so they drained the ponds, but it wasn't necessarily reactive to cold weather. So we didn't get the, the, the cold that we needed in order to 
effectively kill the crayfish in their burrows. So we're going to be doing that again this year. And again, they're going to be watching the forecast to draw it down uh, prior to those, those really cold freezes. Um, and then we're going to continue to survey the water bodies around City View Park in 2024. We're going to keep looking. We're going to make sure that we have our fingers on the pulse as to what's going on. We did develop signage. Uh, I worked with a variety of partners to develop that sign on the left, um, which is really just trying to discourage individuals from releasing any form of pet, but especially crayfishes at this location. We also developed a postcard, which we'll, we will be printing and distributing to partners just really just trying to increase awareness and outreach around the topic and the issue. And of course, the city of Burlington also installed their own prevent the spread of invasive species sign at their location, because at the end of the day, we do suspect that this was a, a pet release. So with that, I just want to say again, report invasive species is so fundamentally important that we all report invasive species. You know, the individual, again, who, who reported the initial marble crayfish didn't even know what it was, didn't know what it was, but just curiosity alone led to all of this work that's now ongoing to try to, you know, curb the stem of, of, of flow of this species before it's given an opportunity to go any further. We need to stop it in its tracks. And the way that you do that is through early detection and rapid response. And early detection is only made possible by individuals like yourselves who go online and report or give us a call to report invasive species or even things that you don't know what it is because sometimes it ends up being a marble crayfish. So you can call us 1-800-563-7711. You can email us, isap at ofh.org. You can create an EdMaps profile at www.edmaps.org or you can join our iNaturalist project, uh, which is invasive species in Ontario. So with that, if you'd like to contact us, you can email Premick himself, uh, premick.hammer at gmail.com. And you can also email me, brook underscore schreier at ofah.org. So with that, again, I just want to thank all the partners for all their, their assistance in creating this, this slide deck from providing uh, input and expertise to providing uh, photos or Premick providing a drawing as well as many of the photos. I uh, just, I want to thank everybody. And once again, I want to thank the Invasive Species Center for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak about what's been going on around marble crayfish and what's uh, you know in the future in, insofar as what we're going to be doing to manage the species. Okay, thank you so much, Brooke. Um, I'm going to open the floor now to uh, some Q and A. Um, just a reminder for everyone to please use the Q&A chat box rather than the regular chat box, just that way I can keep track of them a little bit better. Um, so we have a three-part question um, in our chat. Part. Yeah. Um, okay. So when does reproduction typically occur? Is it during a certain time of year or based on water temperatures? And do they retain the clutch of eggs similar to native crayfish? See, and this is why I brought Premick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, yes, they do retain um, uh, the eggs. They carry the eggs until they're hatched, and then they carry the young for a for a period of time, um, usually weeks, and it, that depends on temperature. And then they release the young at about the size of the crayfish that Brooke showed you. Um, we suspect, I mean, the Europeans have found that there are two peaks in mating. One is usually in kind of late spring, early summer. And then there is another one in in the fall. Uh, and uh, so I think if you, uh, I looked at the, you know, size classes that we had, and we don't have a lot of crayfish, I'll admit, but even if you look at it, there are about four peaks in there, and it looks like there's two peaks of young. And so it looks like it might be the same scenario here where they had a first brood um, at the beginning of the summer, uh, which was the first uh, juvenile that we caught that was a little bit larger in that, in that trip with Jeff. And then uh, the ones that we caught in the fall are, are uh, the, the second brood. So they, they can breed continuously in the lab, however. So they just basically feed up, get a new ovary, and boom, drop another brood. I think I answered all parts of that. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Um, I'll go to the Q&A box here. We have a few questions coming in. So how did you dispose of the captured marble crayfish? Is there a good way of disposing of other invasive crayfish like the rusty crayfish? Uh, so rusty crayfish, I mean, you do have to be careful, um, and I won't get into it too much, but you do need to make sure that you understand the Fisheries Act. 
and understand the Ontario fishing regulations in Ontario. Um, one should never just euthanize, you know, crayfish in Ontario without knowing what it is you have, uh, you know, for sure. So first thing I would do is report it. Um, if you think it is a rusty crayfish, I would, you know, give us a call or report online so we can have a conversation. That being said, rusty crayfish, you know, you are able to use them as bait in Ontario. Um, so you're allowed to have 36 in your possession, but they're only allowed to be used in a water body where they were captured. Um, so beyond that, just, you know, if you're in terms of euthanizing pet crayfish, it's a tough one. I know there's a variety of methods. Um, Premnik, I don't know if there's anything that you specifically go to in terms of euthanizing crayfish. I, th I think the, the easiest, simplest, and most human way is to just to, uh, to take them home and stick them in the freezer for a couple of hours. Because what it does is it slows them down. They basically slow down their metabolism, go to sleep if you want, and and then and and then eventually die. So if you keep them, if you put them in the freezer overnight, they're for sure going to be uh, yeah. dead. And, you know, about a couple of hours should do it as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have another question here. Uh, has any work been done on barrier designs to prevent overland or upstream movement? So we've been kind of discussing a variety of, of techniques of, of trying to prevent these guys from moving. And so... Again, this is where Premier would come in in terms of like their how far they can travel, you know, what types of uh, temperatures they can withstand while out of water. But as you know, you saw from my slide deck, the city of Burlington did install, you know, wire meshing to try to prevent the movement. The problem with that is because of the size of young of year crayfish, it's particularly hard to, you know, put something in that's so fine that's going to prevent the really young from from traveling. But as I mentioned, the topography of the area around, you know, they have to cross one of the busiest streets, Dundas, to get to Novak, uh, unless there's that culvert connection, as I mentioned uh, before. But beyond that, there, there, haven't, there hasn't really been any conversation around preventing them in terms of walking. Um, again, just because of the topography and because that, that downstream where the, the culvert is that I showed earlier, where we collected some eDNA, where that, that uh, fine wire mesh was installed, there's not really any suitable habitat. You know, we've done extensive monitoring there, same with Conservation Halton, and it's been discerned that, you know, there's not really anywhere for them to go. Um, it's just all dry land and it's all just woods. So not ideal habitat for, for these crayfishes. So hopefully I answered that question. But in general, it's difficult to prevent crayfish from, from moving uh, upstream or downstream uh, because all crayfish will walk a certain amount these guys apparently can walk kilometers if it's wet. So a crayfish, as long as its gills are wet, so during a wet uh, event or if the uh, if the vegetation is wet, the ground is wet after a rain, they they will walk. And that's why you find find these things uh, walking overland because they're trying to disperse. They're trying to find an, another pond, and and uh, so they will walk and they will walk around. I've seen rusty crayfish walking around locks in the in the coertas so you know even a even a lock will not prevent them from moving upstream uh, so it's very difficult you'd have to put pretty wide barriers uh on uh, and basically in encircle the whole water body with maybe those uh maybe those um uh barriers that they use for uh, uh during construction those plastic sheets might actually be good because they're slippery and and but as soon as one would come down they would go through yeah um so another question is sorry if i missed this in the presentation but was monitoring conducted in lake ontario as well um yeah so we did go and that's where that uh robustus was actually captured um so there's ongoing monitoring by basically all of us that's going to continue into 2024. And, you know, eDNA has been collected there and we we will, you know, have to figure out, well, we still need to wait for those results. But as of right now, no, we have not seen any specimens in Lake Ontario. We have not seen any specimens anywhere else besides City View Park. So that is really our, our main focus, but we are not, you know, putting on blinders. And this is why we are expanding our search elsewhere because we want to understand, you know, how big is this right now? Like how big is this, this issue? Is it 
somewhere else? Um, do we need to focus our efforts more broadly? So that's why we have so many partners that we, that's why we have the surveillance uh, kind of set up the way that we do so that we don't just focus on this while in the meantime, there are crayfish elsewhere that are potentially spreading. We need to understand the issue further uh, before we really, you know, double down on, on what it is, what it's going to take to try to eradicate this. But right now, I think our, our only real method that could potentially work is lowering of the ponds. And I think that was agreed upon by the experts in the Czech Republic, if I'm not mistaken. Not mistaken. Yeah. It's important for people to be on the lookout for them and, and report any, you know, potential sightings anywhere. But I think also they are more likely to invade things like man-made ponds or ditches uh, and slower flowing water at first. Uh, this is not to say that we can't find them in a, in a proper stream, right? But they their preference seems to be for, uh, you know, ponds and streams and, and, and lakes kind of things. So, so, you know, if you're on the lookout for them, those, those are the places that they're most likely to be. Never release them, like never release crayfish, right? No. And, and never flush them down the drain. Like uh, Brooke mentioned, you know, if you're watching this and you're in possession of these crayfish and you go, you know, oh no, what am I, you know, I don't want these now. What am I going to do? Do not flush them down the toilet. Do not flush the water, do not put the water from your tank uh, down the sink because these crayfish are tiny when they come off the mothers, as you saw, just a couple of millimeters and you will, you will, you know, potentially release them into the septic system, into the, into the, uh, you know, gutters and, and uh, the stormwater yeah, system. So and and they did that in New York, actually, when they, they were, uh, or I think it was, I don't know, but no, it wasn't New York, it was Wisconsin, where they confiscated some crayfish and made the person drain the tanks down the, the down into the sink. And then they were worried about having them in, in the sewerage system. But they never, luckily, they never found them. But they were actually looking for them in the in the in the water treatment plant to see whether they didn't survive the trip. Okay, great. Um, one question here asks: You said the eDNA detections were stronger the second time you sampled. Why was that? That is something that I think you know, Dr. Chris Wilson would have to answer. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't think he's on the call today. But you know he's you know he's the individual. Him and his in his lab and his assistants are are the people who we rely on for the environmental DNA. Um, if I were going to guess, I mean I wouldn't want to, but it could be just we we collected from the right location this time. Um, you know one thing that Chris has said is because they are a benthic species, like a bottom dwelling species. You know a lot most of their DNA is going to be found kind of nearer to the substrate, so. The ponds themselves, I don't know if people got that from the photos, but they're very challenging to sample. Like these are not conducive to going in and hip waders. Um, that one mouth spot it is, but the rest of it, no, it's, they're surrounded by Phragmites. They're surrounded by Typha species. So it's very challenging to get in there and, and collect um, water samples. We did the best that we could to, to collect those water samples, but it could be that maybe there was a larger uh, grouping of crayfishes in that area at the time when we collected the that eDNA. Um, again, like I'm just spitballing here, but it would really be up to Chris and Christine and, and the others in his lab to really answer that question thoroughly. Great. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left here and I do have some last minute announcements to make, um, but there are a ton of questions we didn't get to. Um, so I don't know if Brooke and Dr. Hammer, if you're willing to type out your contact information in the chat, if people have further sure. questions for you. Um, and of course you can always email oh. the uh, Invasive Species like Center. Emily did. Emily did. Yes, so, thank you, Emily. Perfect. Yeah, feel free folks to, to email myself or email Premick. Uh, we both yeah. been involved in this from well, kind of day one. So, Oops. all right. So I wanted to thank you again for our two guests today for presenting and answering questions. And thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this webinar was recorded and will be posted on our website. Um, just a reminder to please take a couple minutes to fill out our survey. We would really appreciate it. Um, just a reminder, our next webinar will be on January 17th 
at 11 a.m. titled Solving the Mysteries of Beech Leaf Disease, Six Years of Partnerships. So stay tuned for that. Um, lastly, my last announcement is a reminder that our annual Invasive Species Forum is coming up, taking place February 12th to 15th. It is free to register and you can do so by going to the link on the screen. Um, thank you again to everyone who joined us today and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks. you so much. Goodbye everyone, have a great day.